process is for that, um, but I'll figure it out and I'll send it to Joel. I think there's a couple patients in there that gave me permission for public presentation, but not widespread dissemination, and so I may have to remove those slides, but no problem. All the, all the core content should be in there. Okay. Any, were there any other specific technical questions about anything? That will, we'll definitely have more opportunity for questions at the end. So, um, I'm going to specifically talk about chest surgery, um, flattened, flatter chest surgery specifically because as a provider of care for adolescents, that's primarily what I hear people interested in. For folks who don't know, I'm the medical director of the Center for Trans Youth Health and Development at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Um, we have a very robust program, about 1,100, uh, just over 1,100 young people between 3 and 25. Uh, the most people are accessing care around 15, 16 years old. Um, we have a larger number of people assigned female at birth who identify something other than female, either male or trans male or non-binary or masculine, a center or something in that domain. And so I send a lot of people for chest surgery. Um, and, and I took a little, a little foray into Tumblr, which is a good idea if you do this work because you can really get a lot of information and also get some idea of what the community is talking about, young people specifically. So I did a little Tumblr search for Tom surgery, and you can imagine that there are just so many specific blogs about this, just, but just pages and pages and pages of people talking about chest surgery. And so I just pulled a few of these that I thought were really <laughs> valuable. So this is summer before surgery. Yay, summer, um, very sweaty and uncomfortable versus post-surgery, a little less sweaty and much more comfortable. No hate to my old binder. I love that thing with a passion. And then over here, me chilling with unbearable dysphoria waiting until I can surgically remove the hell sacks from my chest. Um, I want two things right now, top surgery and two grilled cheese sandwiches uh, because the humor is abundant and amazing and really, really valuable. I've got 99 problems and at least 87 of them would be solved with top surgery and testosterone. <laughs> I, I think that's good evaluation of realness. Um, I bought a special soap for surgery today and I took a picture of a flowering tree and I called one of my doctors about Thursday. The more I think about it, the more giddy I get. I'm getting top surgery this week. Um, I'm changing for the better and I'm so excited. And I really appreciated this person. Things I cannot wait to do after top surgery, take a shower and just immediately get dressed and do something. Shower in the morning, go outside in the summer and feel cold no matter what. Enjoy the beach, need a jacket in the fall because I won't have to wear the equivalent of three shirts to keep my chest flat. Stand up straight, just feel shirt shirt, <laughs> wipe my face with my shirt at the gym without feeling weird about there just not being skin underneath, go for a run shirtless, sleep shirtless, I'm never wearing a shirt again, <laughs> beat my chest like Tarzan, I think I take too many selfies now, wait for shirtless selfies, <laughs> have sex with my shirt off, wear shirts from stores that were too thin before, wear tank tops, get a cool rib tattoo and wear window shirts everywhere, wear white and light colors, wear v-necks, leave my top three buttons unbuttoned like I'm Ricky Martin, not feel like my back is constantly two seconds away from collapsing into a billion pieces. So this person had chest surgery on their Christmas wish list, testosterone top surgery, hysterectomy, to be comfortable in my own skin. So I wanted to talk about, you can imagine that as, you know, we've been doing youth care and sending young people for surgery since the 90s, the mid 90s. Um, we continue to do so. I've sent hundreds of people for chest surgery, but I think it's valuable to understand what the pushback is and where that pushback comes from. The WPATH standards of care version seven say this about male chest reconstruction, which is what it's called. So chest surgery in FTM patients could be carried out earlier. I really appreciate that Dr. Mosser is on the SOC 8 committee because you can please change the language to be more appropriate um, than what is currently there. So chest surgery, because remember that the WPATH recommendations are surgery at 18. 
okay, at the age of consent. But they put this in there, chest surgery and FTM patients could be carried out earlier, preferably after ample time living in the desired gender role because we can't ditch our vestigial tail of the real life experience, which is incredibly problematic. Um, and after one year of testosterone treatment, and the intent of this sequence is to give adolescents sufficient opportunity to experience and socially adjust in a more masculine gender role. And then this caveat, which I've always appreciated about the SOC, however, different approaches may be more suitable depending on an adolescent's specific clinical situation and goals for gender identity expression. What do the endocrine society guidelines say? Recommend referring hormone-treated adolescents for surgery when the RLE, not only is it the vestigial tail, but it's the ever-present, um, resulted in a satisfactory social role change and the individual is satisfied about hormone effects, desires definitive surgical changes. We suggest deferring surgery until the individual is at, at least 18, but also because some FTM transsexual adolescents present after significant breast development has occurred, mastectomy may be considered before age 18. I could do three hours just on the language in these two sets of recommendations, but I won't because I wanna talk about the existing research about chest reconstruction, specifically for people assigned female birth. In this study in 2009, there were 12 Folks who'd had surgery, there was no regret in that surgery had improved self-confidence, personal relationships, social interaction, work, and hobbies. In 2014, there was a study, Davis, <laughs> it's not just your alarm, but it's also your response to it. Um, 208 folks had decreased anxiety and depression symptoms after chest surgery specifically. And then Van de Grift in 2016, 33 folks improved body satisfaction and quality of life, positive effects on body image relationships and sexuality. One of the significant gaps in the existing research was research on people who'd had surgery under 18. And so we embarked on this study in our program to understand the impact of, of both chest dysphoria, but also surgery on trans masculine adolescents and young adults. And we wanted to assess complications as well. This was a cross-sectional study. Um, we tried to capture every single young person that we had sent for surgery um, to try and get them to talk about what that experience was like. And we also recruited an equal cohort of people who had not been to surgery. There was far more young people who had not yet had surgery, but we just recruited to equal. Um, the participants completed the survey in person or over the phone. We didn't provide an incentive and everybody was available to participate. And we developed prior to that, based on the things that I had heard from thousands of conversations about what it meant to have a female chest contour when you did not identify as female. And so I put these elements into this chest dysphoria scale. We piloted it with some of the young people in our clinic for feedback. We did a factor analysis and ended up with 17 items that looked at across several domains. And each of them we scored on a Likert score from zero to three, never, sometimes, frequently, all the time. Zero is obviously the lowest amount of chest dysphoria, 51 is the highest. So here, here was what we found. We also really, really wanted to show if there were any differences in people who'd had surgery under the age of 18. So in our full sample of 136 folks, um, the average age was about 17.9. In the pre-surgical group, half that were, there were 68 of, the mean was about 16, about 17. We had 39 pre-surgical folks who were under 18 and 29 who were over or 18. And then in our post-surgical sample of 68, we had about half and half that had had surgery under the age of 18 and half who had had surgery at 18 or older. Here's the distribution of the ages at the time of chest surgery. So you can see we had, um, this is 13 years old, two, this is not a great pointer, but we had two young people who had had chest surgery at 13, five at 14, nine at 15, nine at 16, and eight at 17, um, and the rest 18 and older. So what type, well, 
Some people weren't sure what type of surgery they had, but that was only one person. Um, most of the folks in the sample had had double incision surgery that you just heard about from Dr. Mosser. But we also wanted to look at this recommendation about being on testosterone, because when the insurance companies come back to me with, this is not medically necessary because your patient hasn't been on testosterone long enough, and since that's what our guidelines recommend, it's a tough thing to talk about. So we asked people how long they've been on testosterone prior to surgery. And in our under 18 year olds, most of them had been on testosterone less than a year. And, and about 44% had been on a year or more. In our olders, 18 and older, about a third had been on testosterone less than a year and, and two thirds had been on for one or more years. And I'll tell you why this is important in a minute. So then we asked, um, we wanted to assess the length of time between when the person had surgery and when they were taking the survey to just show that there was not a lot of, um, we want to assess was there differences in patient satisfaction if they'd been longer out from surgery or if they had surgery two weeks prior to when they were doing this. And we had a pretty good spread. We had nine folks who were more than three years out of chest surgery. We asked about complications. The most common complications had to do with loss of nipple sensation, either temporary and it had come back, or long-term for folks who had been out longer and it had not come back. Um, loss of sensation in other areas of the chest, so sometimes people have numbness in and around the surgical incisions, but there were a smattering of other things. There were sort of anesthesia complications. I felt like there were some cosmetic issues around my nipple or areola being too large. Dog ears, do folks know what those are? So if people have bilateral incision and they have a little extra weight, sometimes there can be like dog ears or little corners of, of tissue that are underneath the axilla or in the armpits. Unequal chest appearance, excessive scarring, so these were, but overall the complication rate was pretty low except for nipple sensation. We asked questions across these four domains, recreational and occupational, social life and relationships, physical well-being and emotional well-being. I don't have every single question here, but I put in the things that I think were really, really struck me as poignant. So I avoid going to the beach and or swimming in public places because of my chest. So I've divided this by folks who are under 18 and folks who are 18 and older. So these are our minors and our pre-surgical group. 77% I avoid going to the beach or swimming in public places. Post-surgical, 12%. Um, dating or forming intimate partnerships is more difficult. We have just a little under half saying yes, 0% post-surgical. I avoid seeking medical care because of my chest. Almost 8%, so three young people. You can see in our over 18 year olds, 21% not going for medical care because of their chest. And then I feel like my life hasn't started because of my chest. And that's a pretty, look at the number in the people who are over 18. That is really high. That's a really high number. Yes, Asaf. Oh, I'm sorry. So in the kids who are under 18 that were pre-surgical, 51% said, I feel like my life hasn't started because of my chest. And this is people who answered frequently or all the time. After surgery, 0%, right? And then in the kids who are, oh, the young people over 18 or 18, 70%, I feel like my life hasn't started because of my chest. One person, post-surgical. So let's look at, a chest dysphoria scale, which is a composite score, and it adds together all of the answers, right? So here is the distribution of kids who were less than 18 years old, and they were talking about their chest dysphoria. See, this is the frequency. So like one person had you know, a score of nine, one person had a score of 10. And then you can see, though, you can kind of see that this, the most um, common numbers were around here. The mean was 28.6. So this is now compared to folks who had surgery before the age of 18. There's their chest dysphoria scores. And the mean went from 29 to three. Three, okay, so let's look at the kids who are 18, young people 18. That was pre and post surgery? That was pre and post. So the, sorry, let me go back. The red ones are pre and the blue ones are post surgery. So let's look 
at 18 and older, here's our pre-surgical responses and here's our post-surgical responses. So the mean goes from 31 to three and a half. So we did t-tests to look at these and see if they were um, significantly different between under 18 and over 18 and that they were not. So people who had chest surgery as minors, same improvement in their chest dysphoria score as people who were over 18 at the time of surgery. What about um, time on testosterone and chest dysphoria? So this is, I've always wondered about this. You have to be on testosterone for a certain amount of time before chest surgery because clinically that doesn't match up. What happens for people is they have a lot of dysphoria, they go on testosterone, their body starts masculinizing and their chest dysphoria skyrockets because now there's a bigger discrepancy between the way you look and your chest. So we looked at this and we, we found, not surprisingly, that the length of time on testosterone was a predictor of increasing chest dysphoria scores. So in the pre-surgical group, chest dysphoria scores would increase by a third of a point each month that they were on testosterone and had not had surgery, in equaling an increase of four points over one year. Now, the chest dysphoria scale is not, you don't, you know, it's not like, oh, anyone who has a chest dysphoria scale of 20 or over should have surgery. That's not what it was created for. I created it so that we could understand some more of the nuances of what it means to have a chest contour that is not appropriate for you. And this is important because a lot of times in this work we talk about, oh, I just hate my chest, right? We don't explore or talk to or understand some of the more nuanced issues or experiences that people have around this. And this is really, really important when we're talking about decision making. And you're gonna hear me say this wherever you hear me talk. But the major o difficulty to overcome in this work is because the care is organized around all the cisgender people around the trans person feeling comfortable. It's not really rooted in helping people improve their lives. It's organized around all of us feeling okay about all of you experiencing or going through medical interventions. And that's really critical because that is where we 100% get it wrong. We ask this question, do you regret having surgery? Was it a good decision to undergo male chest reconstruction? 100% yes, 100% across the board. Do you ever regret having surgery? 100% never in the kids who had surgery under 18. One person said they sometimes regretted their surgery and here's why. That person very much was planning to carry a child and they had a lot of concern around not being able to chest feed that child. And we went over this and over this at every visit. Like let's weigh what we're looking at. We're comparing or talking about <coughs> your distress around your chest compared to what you wanna do for your future child, right? And it got unbearable, this young person had chest surgery eventually because it was not bearable for him to actually continue to not get surgery. And I'm happy to report he had a child this last year and things are going swimmingly and it's been fine. Sorry. Okay, so I just want to talk about um, sort of what we learned from this study. This was published in JAMA Peds this year, so if folks want to see it, it's available. Um, trans and masculine individuals who've had male chest reconstruction have lower levels of chest dysphoria. And, and chest dysphoria after surgery is low in both folks who got surgery under 18 and those who got it 18 or older. Patients reported relatively low complication rates and little or no regret. More time on testosterone prior to chest surgery was associated with increasing levels of chest dysphoria and male chest reconstruction or chest reconstruction should be considered for patients on an individual basis, not um, adherence to an arbitrary chronologic age or length of time on testosterone. This is also problematic. And let me tell you another weird thing about the WPATH guidelines. In the adult section, they say hormone therapy is not a requirement for chest surgery. But in the adolescent section, <laughs> they make hormone therapy a requirement for chest surgery. It really doesn't, I don't understand, I wasn't invited to that party, so I don't really understand why 
that was that was put forward as as something. Okay, so I just wanted to, I also wanted to get some quotes from people who were talking about having chest surgery from Tumblr, my great source of information. Every single night I name three things I'm grateful for. Today I'm grateful for being alive, my chest, and Uncrustables, because they're delicious. Um, this is so surreal, I couldn't be happier. I'm so grateful and beyond blessed for this opportunity. And thank you to everyone who supported me through this journey. I can't explain the sensation of freedom. I feel I'm truly blessed. Today is a very special day for me because exactly one year ago, today I got top surgery. I'm so grateful because truthfully, this surgery saved my life. For anyone struggling with their bodies or simply themselves in any type of way currently, please know it gets better, your time will come. And until then, just keep pushing and try to love yourself a little more. Today, I finally understood what it means to be free. Dr. Garamoni, you saved my life. 15-year-old me, we did it. So yay that Dr. Garamoni is doing chest surgery on people under 18, because he wasn't for a long time. Um, hello, everyone. I know I didn't talk on here much anymore since I've mostly migrated to Twitter, but I want to pop back on here to share some big news. I got top surgery yesterday. I'm ecstatic. This is something I've wanted ever since I realized I was trans six years ago, and it feels like a huge step on my journey. Should you think that I am horribly biased in my checking for information, I also searched these things on Tumblr. Trans man top surgery regret? Nothing. <laughs> Trans masculine top surgery regret? Nothing. This is about it for trans masculine top surgery regret. Try another search? No. So I just, I'm gonna wrap up my portion by saying thank you to my amazing partner, Aiden Olsen, <coughs> who's in the back and he's speaking later this today. Um, I have an amazing team. My team, I didn't have a team for a long time. I was like this weird, like one person band. <laughs> it was like that monkey with the drum and the this. But I really do have a great team and I'm so grateful for them. But really everything that I've learned in my experience doing gender care has come from my patients. And I'm really, really grateful because this is, I, I was really not happy with medicine when I first started doing it. And when I found this work, it really changed my life. And so um, we wanna open it up for questions and comments that um, people have. It's very, very rare that I leave time for questions. So this is really <laughs> extraordinary. And I'm gonna go back and put Dr. Mosser back up here. We'll find his face down here. There you are. Okay. <coughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yay. I don't know if I can make a computer. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Hello. We can see your beautiful countertops. And your oh, 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 yeah. The your granite. very styly oh, cutting granite. board and that nice refrigerator. <laughs> I have a chef wife, so I, that's where we put all of our everything. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we want to open it up for questions for folks. Um, oh my goodness. Well, we're just going to go this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Go. So I'm a psychologist who works with trans youth. And um, when I endorse them for surgery for um, through the, the um, insurance companies, they want, there's a, a, a part of the form that says, I have discussed the complications or the, or the problems with these procedures. And just ethically, what am I supposed to say to them? <laughs> That's a, well, I mean, this is what, th you remember what I said about this all being about the comfort of the cisgender folks around the trans person? This is a great example, right? Where in other mental health domains are you all asked to talk about the medical complications of a procedure, right? right? So here's one thing that, um, I'm not a mental health provider, but I can imagine that um, there are very, very specific things that people need the insurance companies need to feel okay about somebody else's body. Um, you can say, I've talked about the complications because now you know some of them. And you can also say, and there's very, very little regret. And they, they know that, they understand this, this is a procedure. I wanna ask, 
Aiden and Olson Kennedy to just speak to that question for a minute because he's in the back. Okay, let me just say that I forgot my glasses in Los Angeles, which is why I'm wearing sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to be too cool. So, um, I, you know, when I write a lot of letters, I write, at this point, I've probably written maybe close to 200 letters for surgery in the age of 14 up until 70s or 80s. And I feel really clear that um, the insurance companies are looking for eight things. Right, the same eight things over and over and over and over. And so I reply or respond to those eight things. And um, I feel really comfortable and confident saying that, um, that, that I, well, I'm being asked to comment on somebody's gender dysphoria, not identity, right? And as long as I have clarity about those two things, right, um, that's an important piece. I never put in any letters that I've discussed medical complications. It's way outside the scope of my practice. I'm a social worker. Like, right, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, I'm not any of those sorts of things. And so I'm not even gonna pretend to accept that responsibility. Right, I'm not even gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have 100% faith in the surgeons that they're gonna do that work because that's their job, right? Like, I feel like we have a cooperative relationship. They're looking to me to have a conversation about gender dysphoria, and I'm gonna look to them to have a conversation about medical complications. So I really approach it with an understanding of, of playing the insurance companies game, and it's the same eight things across the board, across the country, for me. Is that hard? Mm -hmm. Which are? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to take up, I'm happy to have that conversation offline, or if that's relevant, we have some other <laughs> workshops. I don't want to take time away from Scott um, and, and Joe, though, but I'm happy to have that conversation throughout the today, for sure. And, and actually, no letter has ever been kicked back that said, Oh, therapist, you didn't mention that you discussed the complications. Yeah. So, yeah, there's some things you can leave to the other folks. Was there a two in this? Oh, okay. I, um, I'm hearing a lot of kids coming in concerned about weight restrictions around surgery, that they need to lose a certain amount of weight, and I think jazz might be the, the blame for that, and they're all watching mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if, um, I know every surgery is a little bit different, but is there any medicine or clinical reasoning behind that? Um, and where do things stand with like ideal weight for surgery and weight restrictions around surgery? And then a sort of a related question, um, I know every surgeon is different about letters required, but um, I'm trying to get some clarity around like how to tell patients what to expect as far as how many letters do they need um, and what do they need to have before a consultation with the surgeon. Gotcha. I can uh, handle that one, is that all right? Yeah. Go. So uh, with the rest of weight, um, the, the the plastic surgery philosophy on weight um, for other procedures is that above 35, above a BMI of 35, you do have more complications for some procedures, namely breast reduction and, and abdominoplasty. Um, I haven't seen that play out for this surgery. I do not have a weight limit or a BMI limit, and I've done a BMI of 65, and I think next week I have a 340-pound patient that's going to get top surgery, and that's non-problematic for my practice. And I don't see an incidence of any complication except that the nipples do seem to have a little bit more of a struggle for really morbidly obese patients. Um, so, uh, but it's out there in the plastic surgery literature that above 35, you're gonna get yourself into trouble for all sorts of procedures. So many many surgeons and some at Kaiser will just put uh, a line down based on a BMI. Um, and forgive me, I did have something to say about the other question, but I forgot what it was. What letters. was the other? What the letters. Before consultation? Oh, and the letters. Uh, so um, for, for insurance approval, you're gonna need one letter, for sure. Um, that's just, if you don't need insurance approval, it, it, then there are some surgeons that use the informed consent model, um, which is, Basically, they treat it like all the other procedures they do, and they inform an, uh, you know, a patient and their decision makers. Um, for adolescents, um, I still require letters. There is no informed consent process for adolescents in my practice, only for adults. And um, usually, you should be getting two letters for adolescents just because insurance companies sometimes will adhere to a two-letter requirement, and it just helps helps with time. Usually there's going to be a therapist and a primary care physician anyway involved, and they can just both generate letters that um, that can be very, very helpful up front, hitting them with all the paperwork that, that they need without a lot of back and forth. This row. Susan. I, I just want to say that I a lot of the insurance companies would say uh, in this medical Now, 
and just some as a therapist. A little bit of language, like I, I discourage people from saying child in their letter. I think people should always say young person or, you know, or their name, or, their name or, or right. but, yeah. So when I do my letters, if the person has not had their name legally changed yet, I will mention the first sentence, their legal name, but after that I will say <coughs> name is whatever their name is, and that's what I will use throughout the rest of the letter. So these are just places and spaces where we we can be um, advocates even in these, in, these, in these places of our letters. So I have two separate questions. One is, so I do primary care in Sacramento, states really. So if I have someone, so a lot of people drive really far to get surgery, so they come to me for complications. So what advice do you have for primary care for taking care of people? After surgery, they can't get back to their surgeon. That's. Good. I would I would get on the phone with the surgeon um, if you have any re re reluctance or reticence. Um, you know, surgeons are accustomed in all work except for maybe this work and a few surgeons that have a worldwide following for other procedures. All surgeons are are are, are expecting to take care of all of their own post-operative issues as a normal course of being a surgeon. So the fact that someone would be far away and would have need for the, all, you know, I would have to say all ethical surgeons, the overwhelming majority of surgeons overall, would be more than happy to talk to somebody that is dealing with something and process photos and talk through what needs to be done and, you know, what the next steps would be if it got worse from here. So um, I hope that you don't have any surgeons that are reluctant to do that because that, that would really be a, a, a standard of good medicine. I mean, like, so I have patients who go to, like, Colorado or across the country to get surgeries done, and then they're back in Sacramento. So they're not not really available for me to call because I've busy practice, and so they may not be able to go back to that surgeon if they're getting something done with Massachusetts, something like that. So yeah, I can't. You know, it's it's unrealistic to say, oh well, here's how you quickly make yourself a. Um, you know, you have to use the fund of knowledge of the surgeon. Uh, I, I don't know how I can reconcile your practice being too busy to reach out to them and not. <laughs> but the, 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 the person that is um, that, that knows exactly the recipe for managing those things is the surgeon, and they should have time on their schedule, absolutely, to talk to you. So maybe you have other people in your practice that could interface with the surgeons as, as necessary, but. That's where all the free knowledge is to, to help you in every way that you're hoping to be helped. Um, without utilizing that resource, I, I'm not sure what other secondary um, mechanisms would be available to you. Yeah, and, and, and it's probably important because this, I do a lot of post-op care as well, but um, almost every surg surgeon who does this work has on their site stuff about post-operative care and complications. We just, we kind of print them all from everywhere and we have them available for folks to look at, like, oh, these are the common things that happen, because usually it's very rare that something falls outside of the common complications. So I remember when I first was doing this, like, oh my gosh, you know, how am I gonna take care of like post-op granulation tissue and vaginoplasty? And then like, I, I learned it and did it, now I know. And so I think um, suture retention is a really common one, and thinking about uh, wound dehiscence for chest surgery or uh, superficial infections or even cellulitis. Those are the more common things. Um, and, and that being said, I've actually never had a problem getting a hold of a surgeon, except if somebody go had gone to Thailand. That might be a little <laughs> bit more complicated, but for the surgeons in the United States, it, people have been really available. And sometimes I'll say like, oh, can I take a picture of this and send it to your surgeon and so that we can figure out how to, how to grapple with it. Um, the other one I had is though, I have a lot of people go to UCSF and I have patients who I sent to them and they said, no, I have to be on hormone therapy for a year for uh, trans men. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. There's no reason to do that. And they said, no. So is there any new process for them to start changing that? Because it's really kind of annoying for a center mm -hmm. transgender excellence Insurance. I don't work at San Francisco, <laughs> but um, I think you know. I think that there are. First of all, then then you send them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th there's ways to like if somebody really needs chest surgery and they're bumping up against something that actually doesn't make sense, um, then just send them yourself. Yeah. That's probably the easiest answer. Well, they they want to put the referral. 
Then I just send them, and then they'll, they'll bounce it back and say you have to wait. No, no, send them to the surgeon. Oh, OK. Send them to the surgeon. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, here's something that is, is really universally true, is that th there is, um, I think that more and more people, in the time that I've been doing this work, more and more clinics have been popping up, and people are doing this work. There's still a tremendous lack of consensus, mm -hmm. especially people doing youth care. And so I think that there could be like value in thinking about, I mean, I think about like, well, where does that requirement exist? That requirement exists in the endocrine guideline. The program run by an endocrinologist is probably gonna be the requirement, right? And so, you know, you can send, if you feel like, you know, you have a patient in front of you who needs chest surgery, send them to the surgeon and you do the letter. You know, that's that's an easy workaround with that one. Uh, is anyone else in the question? Um, I'm gonna oh, sure. Wait, I'm gonna come back to you just because I have yeah. this whole half of the room. Um, do you have any recommendation um, for language around which I think she in turn felt, she said, I felt judged, you know, we have this whole long conversation. I was, I think her problem and her challenge was that her kid was non-binary and that there was, maybe she didn't really understand the life or death quality of it because it was, it didn't fit within binary um, and that was already uncomfortable. And so then to add on top chest surgery when they're not even participating they're not even doing trans guy right. Right. <laughs> but that's uh, seriously, and so I I kind of felt lost in a sense because I didn't really know any statistics around non binary or any you know language to help with that. So are you a mental health provider? Yeah. So the question is, are is there language to help parents understand the importance of chest surgery for some folks who identify as non binary? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So um I think that I really appreciate like looking at Dr. Mosser's slides and seeing like, okay, on the, the, the there is not one, like this chest surgery isn't only for male identified yeah. people, right? Like it's, there's a lot of people who have chest dysphoria. I know that in the paper that I wrote, I also talked about this. That um, And so maybe that's, these are good resources. Um, I think it's, well, no one ever died from being judged. I'm just gonna put that out there. But um, <laughs> but I also think it's it's valuable to position yourself as, as the professional, Yeah. right? I think that you all, for the folks in the room that are mental health providers, you're really kind and all of that, but you're also the professional, right? And so owning the fact that you're the professional and you have seen what happens to people and what chest dysphoria does for people, right? And so you can put your opinion out there if your professional opinion feels judgy to someone, that's actually not yours, that's right. theirs. But it's also valuable. A lot of times young people will not say to their parents what they will say to you as a provider. And so I do, I have conversations with young people that are really conversations for the parents sitting over here, but it allows me to bring out the things that the young person is experiencing so that the parent can witness it in a way that isn't isn't saying like, I know what your kid's going through better than you. It's like, well, some people have, you know, a lot of folks in my practice come in and they tell me that all these different domains of their life are impacted by their chest. I'm wondering if you could share like maybe one or two of the spaces where it's just the hardest for you, you know, and, and sort of allowing them, it's just like how kids won't, um, a lot of times young people will not They'll say, oh, whatever my parents want to call me is fine. They've been calling me blah, blah, blah for whatever number of years. And I'll say to the young person, like, how does it land for you when somebody says, my son, or the, sir, or he's you, or you know, uses your birth name? And, and that person can tell me, and it's not hurting their parent directly, right? Yeah. But it's getting the information across because young people are so protective of their parents, right? They don't want to hurt their parents. And I don't know what this feels like, but I can imagine that 
your authentic self being bothersome or troublesome or painful for other people is a really, really difficult space to be in. And so giving them that opportunity is really helpful. And we just need more data on non-binary folks. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, that's really important. Yeah. Anybody else in that room? Yeah. Um, sorry, just to follow up, I really appreciate So the, the challenge is that with minors, they need parental consent in order to undergo surgery. And so what are some things that I do with parents? The truth is that sometimes it's time. Sometimes I know that it's time and it's painful and I have to make sure that I'm having a conversation with the young person about like, I see you and I hear you and this might take some time and I'm fully committed to getting your parents there. And, and it's, it really is, if you have those conversations for people, and by the way, I keep a poster version of my chest dysphoria study, a mini version of it that I give to parents. And I say, read through this and look at the profound impact of chest surgery. Because of all of the things that we do for trans folks, Name and pronoun and chest surgery are the pro and genital surgery for trans feminine folks are the three and maybe facial feminization, the, the the most most impactful procedures, without a doubt. I think probably maybe even more than testosterone. I think that chest surgery is a profoundly important um, pr procedure for people, and and I think it's also it's very important when engaging parents to help understand what their fears are. What is your fear? Let's talk about and address the things that you are concerned about for your young person, right? And, and we all know, if you do this work, you know it's the same five things, right? What if they regret it? What if they change their mind? What about cancer causing hormones? What about testosterone and estrogen being bad for your body? And what about my grandchildren? Right? And that's really, everything sort of falls <laughs> under those domains, right? And, and so really helping move through and say, okay, let's talk about the places that you're stuck here, right? And let's talk about, I mean, I've even moved to talking about like, let's weigh, let's really look at what we're weighing, right? Because we're balancing, if we're rooted in this idea, these falsehoods of A, we can make someone accidentally trans. And, and that sounds really stupid, but people actually think that, right? Like, well, you're gonna make someone trans who isn't. Even though we've been working really hard to make trans people not trans and failing horribly at it, right? But we have some kind of relationship with cisgender fragility. That's not a thing, but people have a relationship with it. If you're rooted in and, the worst possible outcome is that you're trans. Right? These are the sort of undergirding things that make all of this really hard for people, right? Because they're still rooted in gender essentialism, we're gonna accidentally make someone trans who isn't, and being trans is the worst possible outcome, right? But none of those things are true. And so helping get to the root of the cause, and, and I'm very judgy. I really appreciate you said that because I'm a, I'm a very judgy person. I really try to rein that in when I'm with parents because I know that that's really important, right? Like, this is their one trans kid. I've had a thousand trans kids and a thousand families and a thousand conversations that are the first conversation. But for them, it's their first one, right? And so really trying to say, okay, well, you know, and listening is a big part of that. Because I think a lot of times parents of teenagers don't feel listened to. And that's a real big problem. I just want to say, I hope so too. Yes, we have great, nothing helps parents move like other parents of trans kids. Because in some ways, those are the most credible, most legitimate folks that they can resonate with. 
right? And so it's like, oh, I mean, we've had parents in our support group that say, I was sitting right where you were like four months ago, and I also was crying. And I'm here to tell you that that's okay. And, and it really, nothing, you know, nothing helps move people like other parents. I'm also a therapist and thinking about those conversations. Um, the two things that come up that would be helpful to know, one question for each of you. Um, Joe, in your research, people are worried, the parents I've talked to are, these kids want surgery as teens. Can't, normally parents don't let teenagers make life irrevocable decisions that are, right? I mean, that we don't usually have our kids make decisions for the rest of their lives. And yet we let them drive. <laughs> Which, yes, maybe, I, I'm not a fan of that, but. <laughs> sort of um, analog FTM mastectomy. But the answer there is 
not to make it more complex than it was, but just to follow the dysphoria. Follow the dysphoria, follow the dysphoria, and we successfully have so far gotten this patient to a, a, a position of extreme comfort. So um, the dysphoria is what guides us over and over and over again um, for many of the complex decisions. It, and there is actually a really great paper on the side effects of binding that came out a couple years ago, and that might be another great place, and making sure that people aren't gonna use that as a reason to deny binders to their young people, but as a like, okay, you know, oh, and another great thing, if you have parents who have chest tissue themselves, they can wear a binder for a day mm -hmm. and get a lot of opportunity for empathy. For 10 minutes, you can wear it for 10 minutes. Mm. Where, Joe, where's the paper? Um, I don't remember okay. where it is, but I'll give you give you my um, email and I'll let you know. Lastly, and maybe a much bigger question, but I was curious if either of you have uh, anything you do kind of anticipatory or responding to postoperative depression, or the things you prepare folks for, or how do you respond? To it? Yeah, I mean, I. I have not in my practice, I have 100% of people who've had genital surgery have had post-operative depression. Virus regret, temporarily. I've never had anyone who had chest surgery have that. But it is something that I always talk about and say, look, this is a big surgery. I'm not saying it's the wrong surgery, it's most likely the correct surgery for you. And post-operatively, you have anesthesia in all of your cells, your chest looks like pizza, um, you, there's a lot of things happening that, that can impact your health and well-being and your mental space after surgery. So I always tell people before surgery, if that happens, just know that it's really common and you're, you're most likely going to roll out of that. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Scott. Um, maybe only just a little bit. It's interesting because I... Okay. I'm going to say this and say thank you for talking about um, post-operative depression. It's so important. Nobody talks about this. It was really hard for me. Or occasionally adult patients tell me that they're really struggling with depression after surgery for a little while. Interestingly, it doesn't seem to happen at all in my adolescent patients. And I'm developing a little bit of a theory that, you know, post-operative depression is really just life after surgery is really hard for a short while, and if you don't have a support system, you're gonna feel really lonely and really fragile, and that might help you feel depressed. I'm sort of learning that. I think a lot of the adolescents that are making it to surgery have a tremendous support system in place that is doting on them after surgery, yeah. and that's enough to not have any post-operative depression at all. But if you're alone and an adult and struggling to pay the rent, and yeah you're feeling super fragile, you don't know if you're gonna to descend towards oblivion. And um, so anyway, that. Uh-oh, I lost you. Um, went on. And now I'm saying that it's probably not. Sorry, I must have disappeared. No, you're, yeah, you're cutting in and out, but that may be another thing for having surgery younger, actually, is the support system in place. Okay, announcement, we are done. Thank you all very much.